This episode is brought to you by Fooley Gemstones. We've all seen cape-colored um, diamonds that are just beautifully open with an open culet and facet, you know, the faceting done for candlelight rather than these intense lights we have now. She would use it if it was beautiful or a PK stone. Why not? I mean, she set some giant stone. I mean, we, we, you see the drawings. I mean, there's some 30, 40 carat diamonds in there. So what if it might, might have had a certificate? Well, there were no certificates back then. A certificate that, you know, wasn't triple X and D flawless. I, I think it gives her more credibility as an artist. I'm Carol Holton, the voice of jewellery. Welcome to If Jewels Could Talk. I'm an author and broadcaster and the woman who initiated the role of jewellery editor at magazines like Tatler and Vogue. This is a podcast for everyone, for people who do like jewellery, for people who don't realise they like jewellery, and anyone intrigued by fascinating facts, new ideas and forgotten histories. So join me as I tell sparkly tales and meet all sorts of people, delving into four centuries of jewellery culture, and investigate what's happening now. In Paris, during the 1930s, for about 44 years, at number 59, Rue de Chateau d'Anne, a steady stream of the world's elite, climbed the stairs to the third floor to visit the studio of Suzanne Belperon. Sometimes she saw 18 people in a single day. It was the who's who of Hollywood, royalty, finance, politics, people like Jean Cocteau, the Aga Khan, Diana Freeland, the King of England, Jean Lanvin, Mel Oberon, Mona Bismarck, Mrs. Gary Cooper, I mean, I could go on and on, the Duchess of Windsor, Lauren Bacall, Catherine Deneuve. They all booked to see a woman who I would class as one of the great master jewellers of the 20th century. Someone who never signed her work, who created an entirely new repertoire in jewels. What Coco Chanel and Elsa Schiaparelli were doing at the time in the world of fashion in France Suzanne Belperon was doing in jewellery. I'm delighted today that we have the president of Suzanne Belperon and one of the world experts about her life to discuss her life, which was an extraordinary time through the war. Nico Landrigan, thank you for joining us from New York. What a great pleasure to join you. Thank you, Carol. I wanted to know, because Suzanne Belperon and her partner Jean Hertz closed their business in 1974. Your family bought her name in 1998, is that right? It began a bit earlier, but yes, I think the final bit of paperwork was was completed uh, then. Uh, but actually it began uh, shortly after my father bought Verdura um, in the mid-1980s. The, the sleeping archive of Belperon, which is all it was at that point, um, and those who loved it, uh, thought that, well, maybe this fellow Landrigan would be the right man to relaunch Belpro. And in fact, they approached my dad, I think only a year or two after he had, he had bought Verdura. And he said, but I, I couldn't possibly, I've, you know, I've barely got this thing going and I've spent every penny I have. Um, they said, well, nonetheless, you might be the right person. So let's, um, let's come up with something. And it was the, uh, partnership that arose out of that that, um, eventually led to my dad being able to, to finally buy the, the whole thing by the end of the nineties. Yes. And since then, you've been restoring the Belperon name and possibly might I complain you've done too good a job because you kind of priced us all out. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it is really quite frustrating how, how expensive things, certainly her original jewelry is that she actually touched and that coinciding with the, rise in cost and value of everything else, uh, it has. And some of these things are, are, are hard, to, hard to touch. But I will say, because we make new pieces also from the original designs, and we're you know, careful about, about costs um, for the new uh, pieces from the original drawings, it's really the vintage that has remained very expensive, whereas some of the new ones, I and mean, we, have, we have things for under 10,000 that I think are really beautiful that I'm very proud of. I mean, her pieces go for what, four times the estimate at auction? Or... Often. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. What was it about her jewellery that originally appealed that you thought that you really wanted to own it and and restore it? My first exposure to it was uh, in Paris. I think I was 11, maybe 12. It was a family spring holiday trip. And I remember spending the day, as we did, you know, when traveling my parents, we would, you know, we pings between museum and cathedral and, and church and exhibition. And I remember finding ourselves in a a family friend's apartment. I, I was, remember sitting on the floor with a giant binder books resting on the sofa. So it was also sort of backwards, but the way an 11 year old sits looking through the original gouache 
paintings of Suzanne Belperon of, of jewelry, thousands of them. And I remember thinking at that age that what I was looking at and was able to touch was every bit as good and fine and to, to me, remarkable um, as what I'd seen hanging on the walls of these museums um, earlier in the day, and I and I truly I, I remember that, and um, the fact that later on in life, you know, a lot happens between age eleven and whatever age I was that I started with my dad. The chance to be given the responsibility to turn these beautiful paintings in two dimensions into three dimensional pieces, as conceived by the original artist is just an enormous privilege. And I think she was a, she really was, uh, and now this is where I have to be careful, but I really do believe if she had not chosen jewelry, but rather fine art, as they call it, um, I think hers would be a household name. And I know now it, it isn't that, just because jewelry is already a very niche thing and it's expensive and la la la. But if she had been a sculptor or a painter in large, large format, I think, um, I think she'd be a very famous woman indeed. She really was, as you say, she was painted with gemstones. It was part of her taste and her her choice of gemstones that was extraordinary. But I think also at the time, it was very unusual, wasn't it, for a woman, and especially a woman from her background, that was very modest. I mean, she was brought up with no electricity or heating, wasn't she, in eastern France? That's right. So could you tell us a little bit about how she made that leap from this very modest start to becoming one of the world's greatest jewelers. Yes, I'll try. I mean, she indeed her her, her father was a, a baker who tragically died when she was only thirteen. Uh, by the way, her her maiden name was Vuillerme. Um So at this at this point, little Suze, how she signed her early her early little drawings, Suze Vuillerme was um, was a very gifted draftswoman, and her mother recognized this, took an extra job to be able to pay for it, but managed to get an application to the local um, art school. And this is Besançon, which is uh, actually had quite a very, uh, quite a good one. And it was this, as you said, in this, in the southeast of France, this was, this is the region, the Jura, that is, you know, near Switzerland. It's in fact, originally where the um, watch industry sort of was born. And then I think it moved into Switzerland for tax reasons. This is centuries ago. But anyway, so it was a strong uh, tradition in the in the area, but this of course is um, the 19 teens, which we know was happening in Europe. So World War One had sapped all the young men who would have been in these art schools, learning their their local craft, um, and they were in the trenches, tragically dying. So partly because of that, Suzanne had the opportunity to go to school, and it's quite remarkable. We have some of the correspondences between her mother, who was obviously deeply invested in her daughter's success, and her art. Her, her teacher, and I don't know how common it was, but I, my understanding of the French education system, it's, you know, hyperbole of excellence is, is really rarely given. And um, she said, the, the professor said that she was ready for le, le métier um, and after, I think, six months. I mean, it was, a, you know, it was a years-long course, and it, she was such a prodigy. She was doing her not just her penmanship and her painterliness, but she was designing what we, and we have these drawings here, I'm happy to show you these paintings, um, we have her her sort of final art portfolio from her graduating year. You would look at them and you'd say, well, yeah, sure, I can date those if I had to guess. You know, so I'd say high deco, maybe late 20s. This was 1917. This was a teenage girl who, in the middle of the war, had never even been to Paris, much less another country, and she was inspired by Egyptian motifs. There was, um, the, the in fact, interestingly enough, the oldest public museum in France is in Besançon. So that's where she saw some artworks and jewellery, because I was going to say, otherwise she wouldn't have seen jewellery in her ordinary life. No, again, I mean, the, the town had, you know, the craftsmen, but no, the great the great Finnish pieces would have would have left to go to the great other cities of, of, of Europe and the, and the rest of the world. So her hand was already extremely confident. Again, for any teenager to, to, to be doing something that you would say that 10 years later would become, would, would begin to become the most famous and, and loved jewelry style of the 20th century. It's quite, quite remarkable. So she started experimenting then with bold shapes and the sort of geometry, the triangle, square, circle. And you're quite right to say that. I mean, Art Deco obviously was named for the, ex, you know, the Exposition des Arts Décoratifs, but we use, right, we use it as shorthand for, as you say, the, uh, the ex, sort of ex, experimental arrangement of, of simple geometric shapes. And it, and she really was she, not just the, uh, one of the pioneers of that. She was, she was a decade ahead. And the fact that she 
you know, we, I, mean, I don't want to fast forward too far, but um, at age 19, she did move to Paris and and had the chance to uh, to actually start to practice her, her craft. And she really, ch- she, she changed jewelry design in the 20th century, quite simply. So she went to uh, Boivin, the Maison Boivin. Yes, yeah, so Boivin, I just think it's a fascinating sort of confluence of events. The founder of the House of Boivin, uh, which by this point was the fifth largest jeweler in Paris, which is saying something, given the strength of the tradition there. And it, uh, René Boivin had just died. And he, he, the founder and head designer, left his, his widow Jeanne, of course, in the company. But she had to figure out what to do next. And um, she had, a, she had a, a daughter who was of, of similar age. And the young Suzanne and Miss Boivin met. And she said, Mom, maybe you should take a look at this young lady. I, you know, she's, she, she can draw. And to Jeanne's, you know, undying credit, she staked her family's fortunes on hiring this teenage girl. Again, I can't believe that the number of things, you know, w- women were not really welcome in this industry. And the fact that a, a, a recent widow hired a baker's daughter who just happened to be so good. And within three years, she was the head designer of the House of Boivin. So there were no ceilings. You know, she, it was just talent that got her there. And really quite remarkable that she was able to do that against against all odds. And um, Jean Boivin was the um, sister of the couturier, Paul Poiret. So do you think that helped in opening up some possible potential clients for when she started working on her own? Because, uh, you know, Boivin and Paul Poiret would have shared these sort of the glittering roster of clients. Certainly it did, yes. You know, I'm gl- glowing about what skills she had, but she also had a great deal of good luck, as, as a, anyone's success would take. And I think back to the idea of looking at jewelry as an art form, um, I think uh, being the sister of Paul uh, Poiret, um, the, the idea that you know Paris in this time was a, a hotbed of, of creativity and, and everything, you know, the world had changed in World War One, And I think that sort of idea that old norms might be out and let's try something new um, was a very ripe, uh, it, it, the moment was ripe, let's say. And growing acceptance of women in the workplace. Yes, right. How were they, how they dressed. Mm-hmm. I mean, they'd, again, look at, look at, I mean, obviously it would happen again in World War Two, but how women, women's efforts had been critical in the war effort. Old norms had to be chucked. So do you think that the style of Boivin changed when she arrived there pretty immediately? Oh, immediately. If you look at the, the early, um, the work that, uh, let's say, René, uh, was responsible for the, the the last commissions that he completed before he died compared to what the house was doing a couple of years later it was a it was a complete change and Suzanne I mean it makes sense I mean if, if, if Jeanne had always harbored a uh, you know a, a desire to design on her own or that she thought her daughter you know should do it they would have they would have chosen you know themselves but the fact is they they knew they needed someone great and the fact that they found it in a in a in a teenage girl i just think is kind of wonderful and she was pursued wasn't she other people came after her fairly quickly didn't they yes i know that she was approached a number of times over the course of her career um including by companies um in the states um but she always wanted to um to stay in Paris. but because no, Tiffany wanted her, didn't they? Supposedly, yes. So eventually she was whisked away by Bernard Hertz in 1932. Yes. And in your book on Suzanne Belperon, you say this is kind of a surprising choice because he was really a diamond merchant. Uh, yeah, diamond and uh, a, a pearl and precious stone. So it was, um, it was all the stones and really the raw materials that Place Vendôme needed. He was... Um, one of the leading dealers in the best of the best. And it was an interesting choice in the sense that she'd had such a wonderful run, let's say, at, 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 at Boivin. How long was she at Boivin? Uh, 1919 to 1932. So just under the, those 13 years. But the fact is, uh, I think you have to briefly mention the, 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 the stock market crash um, in the beginning of the Depression in this story. Because in, in 29, obviously, that that ch- changed the world again. And I think for Monsieur Ertz, he realized that while selling the raw materials of jewelry um, had had become very, very difficult, he noticed that, that those who still had uh, money were still buying jewelry. And so he made it his mission to have his business uh, survive, to, to focus on the, the jewels themselves. And of course, as the leading supplier of all the great materials to all the great houses on Place Vendôme, who else would know the best designer, you know, who might not have a, a name of his or her own at that point. And so he approached Suzanne and said, listen, why don't you come out, uh, leave Boivin, design for me, carte blanche, do whatever you 
like. The company will, you know, will stay as my name, um, but you can do whatever you like. And I think um, at that point for a young, young person to have an opportunity for a, sort of a new chapter in her career, um, she, she went for it. And my gosh, I mean, you know, cover of Vogue within a year and a half of that decision. And even more people began to find, you know, hear word that there was, that there was this remarkable young woman making incredibly beautiful things and very, very much not like everyone else. And, you know, we touched on, you know, the Art Deco style, the geometry earlier. Um, and it's worth noting that once the Art Deco style uh, became so popular, her interest was inversely proportional. She lost her love of it and her interest in it. Um, as a designer, because it had been, I think she felt it had been done. And that's when we start to see some of her, I mean, again, there were motifs earlier on that, that, you know, we can refer back to, but she really did change her personal jewelry style almost out of, I mean, she was a virtuoso. So why would you, why would you stick to one, one style if you could invent an entirely new one? And she did. And, and, and this is an important time to say, she also refused to sign her work. She never let her jewels be signed other than with, you know, the mandatory f- French, uh, sort of regulatory things, the, the poinçon of the workshop and the, the you know, the, the guarantee of the carrot of gold, etc. But what an incredibly confident thing to do, to say, no, no, if you, you don't need a name on the back. If you can't recognize it from the front and from across the room, then that's sort of your problem. My style is my signature, she said. Is that really why she did it? Yeah, I mean, yes, because they would ask her. I mean, she was, she became well, well enough known. She was never a really, you know, public figure, but she was asked any number of times. Why don't you sign? You know, everyone else is doing it. If you look back, obviously, in, into history, artists didn't sign their work. It was the, it was the patron's commission, and that was that. Was that. But, it, you know, we're talking about the 20th century. It, things were signed. She said, no, my style is my signature. Look at it. That's enough. And so this is when she was um, doing a lot of carved domed cabochon, carved semi-precious stones, somehow making them look sort of like they were spirals, stepped pyramids, moving. And I love the quote from Karl Lagerfeld, who was one of her great fans, who said, the stones are the shine and sepia dim, smoky quartz or pale magic equilibrium in everything she made, chalcedony in the shade. Nobody before her did it in the way she did. And it is amazing, these sort of perfect stones that are so beautifully carved, but somehow have a softness to them. I was delighted that he that he chose to put pen to paper. He really he really was a true a true fan of hers and a collector of her work. And I think he put it extremely well. He wrote the foreword. Um, we invited him to write the foreword to our book, and and he, I think he did a beautiful job. It, it sort of reads like a, a love a artistic love poem, and it's worth worth a full read. Uh, there's another one that I uh, just have here that I like. Um, there's a humble splendor you can never find in other designers' work before her. One feels that the heart always prevailed. I love the magic equilibrium in everything she designed. Uh, that, those are Lagerfeld's words. Um, but the idea of magic equilibrium, and, and again, that she was doing this, you know, you can, you can see artists sometimes, you know, experimenting and trying new things, and sometimes it can feel, you know, dynamic and interesting, but forced, if, if I might say, um, that the, the need to have something new. When you look at through her designs, I don't know, they just, you know, we have 9,300 of these, these gouache paintings and, and tracings. They have a feeling of sort of serenity and inevitability. As you flip through these, these books we have, you, you don't feel as though she was searching for something. These things sort of seem to appear complete and composed. And this was the moment where Vogue said she had begun the new theme in Jules which was a new barbaric fashion characterized by weighty magnificence. Beautifully put. I mean, I, I, I love how she, I love how they, they put it. But again, the, I think the context is important there, the historical context, uh, looking at what jewelry, you know, what, and again, this is you are, you're much more the expert than I, but um, if you look at the jewelry of um, Edwardian jewelry and the Belle, Belle Epoque and uh, even Art Nouveau and Art, Art Deco, these are beautiful styles of design but there is sort of a lacy delicacy to so many of the waviness you know feathers and garlands and for a woman to come in and say yeah but what about as you said what about the barbaric what about just something massive still to scale and still you know had to had to fit and be be flattering but why not carve the entire cuff out of a single hunk of rock crystal and let that be the body of the jewel the perversity of inverting where the stone goes and where the metal goes she would of course set you know, diamonds or pearls or, or emeralds down into these 
bodies uh, of Hearthstone. But she was incredibly confident to be able to just chuck the rules and start again. And Dalim is almost like an afterthought. Sometimes, yes. Oh, I mean, and, and I actually wrote in my foreword to, to our book, I think it's really important to recognize mm. that she had no regard for the traditional hierarchy of gemstones. None. She would use, when a citrine suited her better, she would use a citrine, but when, when she wanted a yellow diamond, that was it. And the same thing with diamonds. She would use pavé. She was famous for this now. In fact, some, because she didn't sign her work, so many um, experts and dealers who try to identify uh, her work, they, they've sort of learned some of the tricks, um, visual tricks and techniques she used. When she paved an area, whether it be a leaf or a section, she would bury, as it were, much, much larger stones than any jeweler I've ever seen before or since in and amongst the small stones as a way to sort of keep the eye amused. Mm, so sort of slightly haphazard. So yes. you have so much to look at. Yeah, you have. You cannot sum up a, a piece. You can recognize, but you cannot sum up a piece of hers in one or two looks. You really have to z- get closer. And that's why I think it, you do see people who, who sort of recognize it on a, on a, on a friend's wrist or at a dinner party. I mean, I've, it's happened, I've happened, you know, a hundred times in front of me. They'll say, God, what is that? And they'll talk about it. But, oh, my God, c- can I see it? They'll actually ask them to take it off and they'll hand it around a table because everyone is so curious to see actually how it's made and how all this is sort of put together. But the idea of a, of a five carat diamond mixed in and amongst um, the traditional pavé size is and was unheard of. But it's, it gives incredibly beautiful sort of crusty, barnacle encrusted, but all the diamonds um, sort of look. I think I found the Vogue um, story that the new barbaric jewels came from, and they continued with, we've said it before, we'll say it again. It's one of those great verities that bear repeating, nothing strikes such a false note in this day and age as dinky, small fry jewels. The real thing is enormous, entertaining, ornamental, personal and witty. Um, and I think certainly how enormous and entertaining and just so modern, just endlessly modern and modern now just kind of extraordinary it is i i have the pleasure of 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 seeing people's first reaction to her work who might know jewelry but not necessarily belperon's legacy and they walk into our gallery here in new york and getting to see through their eyes for the first time what she did and as you just said inevitably what i always hear by you know by the third case is my god it's just so so modern and then I remind them that this, oh no, that, that, that the thing that they're pointing to is that, that was done 92 years ago, that one. 92 years ago. You know, you think about it's, it's inconceivable. Clean, yeah, clean lines. I think back to the idea of geometry. I think even though she moved away from that very sort of rigid idea of what makes up art, art deco, the art deco style, I think the editor's eye that she was born with and that I think gave her the interest in that that sort of assembled geometric look. I think even when she moved into these more, as you say, barbaric and some of these tribal designs that she borrowed from, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful cuff she called the Cambodian cuff, and there's a Congolese motif that is kind of wonderful, and uh, and the raw gold she used, which she called or vierge. Sort of like Greek treasures. Precisely, the, the sort of Etruscan-looking things as well. But the editor's eye that she had, I think, kept things at their simplest form. She could introduce new ideas and motifs, but it never got fussy. She would always bring it back down to, let's say, the equivalent of what is a perfect square or the perfect sphere or let you know let's just juxtapose a triangle with a with an octahedron kind of thing and she continued to sort of apply that discipline i think even as she experimented with new designs and i think i seem to remember when you launched the first collection of new suzanne belperon and i think i had the exclusive to do it for vogue and i came to paris and you were creating them in the same workshop that she had been creating the pieces originally. Not quite the same workshop, but there was a, a, a direct a direct family lineage, which was the closest that was was possible at the time because the, the workshop um, that she used did dissolve. But a direct family lineage of the you know the apprenticeship sort of system that they have in in, in Paris, um, down to the craftsmen who who make um, much of our jewelry today. Which we just feel lucky. We, well, we feel. Yeah, just lucky to be able to tap into. Um, it's these things, these techniques were honed and perfected over really over centuries. And the, you know, in, in jewelry to this day, apprenticeship is still, I think, much more a part of, uh, the, the craft than in, I can't, I can't think of anything else. Everything else has been, I think, so changed by technology, but there are techniques that just cannot be done unless you sit at the elbow of an expert for years and practice. 
And nice to have that link that, you know, there is somebody there who would be able to imagine how Madame Belperon would have done it. Oh, yes. And again, also very important that part of our business is to hunt the original pieces. Because, you know, back to my 11-year-old self, it's one if, if we just bought the archive that day and said, okay, now we have this, let's go make them. How do you interpret these two-dimensional brushstrokes into three dimensions unless you see how she did it? And so what we've able, been able to do over these years, I mean, this, I think January is my 20th year in, in the business, studying all the original pieces and all the original gouache paintings in correlation and knowing that this shadow here meant, you know, you, you recess the piece or no, in fact, this is, you know, the finished piece that's, that comes up to us in wax form or partially finished form from the workshop, knowing that, in fact, she meant, you know, there, maybe there are two different ways, to, often there are more than two <laughs> ways to interpret a drawing, uh, knowing what she meant by her rendering. It's a great gift to us. And when these sort of famous people were endlessly trooping off to her studio, they were really going for... I mean, she did something unusual in the way she never wanted a boutique. She wanted this private studio. And it sounds like that she almost had... It was a personal fitting, like a couturier, but also a slightly sort of... um, A very sort of personal counselling session. It was, how did they live? What did they like? What did they spend their days doing? You know, she literally mounted stones on their body, didn't she, to get it absolutely perfect. She did. And she, um, I, I, I take that lesson n- now, um, making sure that we, that we don't only take commissions from, uh, from ideas and from, from, from drawings. Having stones on hand to play with and to see a client's reaction and to see it on the skin, you know, skin tone matters. I mean, and she's famous for making sure that her consultation desk was next to a window to make sure that the light was just right. And that she would look at, you know, the shape of her client's neck or ear, you know, lobes can be, you know, attached or detached. Or She, she absolutely studied not just the, the stone and the design, but how, how the finished piece would actually flatter the, the, the wearer. And that was an, obviously, I mean, when you think about the collector's standpoint, that's everything. But the fact that she was so focused on it, I think, did, I don't want to call it unique, but she certainly stood out. And, and I think the fact that she was the only, the only woman, certainly master jeweler. I mean, I know there are other women who, who were able to, um, you know, contribute and make some incredible designs. But I think all in all, it seems to be accepted that she was the only one who really all, just all around was punching with the biggest and the, and the best. Although this, you know, now we did, now we measure things by commercial success and how many billions have you sold. But I, I think by, by the measure of the, the craft and the art, um, I don't think anyone ever exceeded her. And the legacy, the fact that people want to collect it now. Yes. And it's so sought after. I guess it made her, doing these consultations, made her very close to her clients. She must have got to know them very well. I think so. I th- again, there's a little bit of mystery to her, which I find alluring, because I think she was also a very private person. I don't want to, you know, paint her just in contrast to Verdura, but but it's worth saying, you know, the colorful Sicilian duke who was best friends with everyone and, you know, whatever it is, Elsa Maxwell's, you know, most fun dinner party list. You know, Suzanne, was she loved the ballet and she liked to read, but she, you know, she was a private person. So I, I don't know how well she knew her clients in that in that sort of social sense, but I think she, I think she made a study of, of each of them um, to make sure that at least the, that the jewelry uh, would suit them. And she was so private that, in fact, she she did have a relationship with Bernard Hertz, didn't she? But that only came to light because of what subsequently happened during the war. Yeah, it's really difficult to read the letters. Yes, she did. And um, do you think she liked him romantically when she took the job? That's a good question. I don't know. I'm curious, but it, I sort of feel like it's none of my <laughs> my business. So I just sort of, um, I we know my my favorite part of that of her uh, the story of her allegiance with with the Hertz family. Um, actually, if I may, it just sort of skips to the end of the war. Speaking of Bernard, though, she had um, he was arrested once. She helped to get him released once by the Gestapo. They all encouraged him to to flee Paris, and he wouldn't. Why wouldn't she flee? She wouldn't, but also because, she, uh, you know, as a Gentile, she didn't, there wasn't the same personal risk. But 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 as as Bernard and the Hertz family are, are, are Jewish, you know, there was a real fear and an, an understanding that it was, it was a dangerous, very dangerous place to be. Um, but he wouldn't do it. But the one thing he insisted, and this is interesting, was that she, Suzanne, by the company 
uh, from him, not for his benefit, but to protect it. Otherwise, it was a Jewish asset and it could be seized. And indeed, she raised money. She scraped everything she had. She she had a, f- a friend who had some family money, the furniture designer, Marcel uh, Coar. Anyway, she had helped to do it, but she did buy the company and they changed its name officially, registered from B. Hertz to Suzanne Belperon, S-A-R-L, which is their ink. Even though Bernard was arrested again, um, she managed to keep up a, a letter correspondence with him. She got care packages sent to him, food and, and other essentials. Because he was under guard in Paris, wasn't he? So she was able to go and take him. She laundered his clothes. And uh, I, I mean, was that usual? Or did she did she bribe a guard that he took clean clothes in and out and food packages? I, again, I wish I, I, I wish I were a, a real expert in, in how unusual that was, because I don't know of any other examples, but that doesn't make it unique. But it, it certainly seems to me that she did move heaven and earth to, to try to make him as comfortable. as. And again, they didn't know the outcome at that point, because they didn't know about the camps, of course, but he was transferred to one and, and, and killed, and she just lost contact with him. And I'm, I'm sure she feared the worst. I mean, she was taken, arrested by the Gestapo, wasn't she? And taken to the headquarters on Avenue Fogg. Yes, but I, I think just my understanding was that it was because um, she was associated with a Jewish family. But, uh, but of course, um, I don't know how they proved one's religion at that point, but she was able to. Um, she, was, she was Roman Catholic. But didn't they want her client list of Jewish families who might have frequented her studio? Oh, yes. But I mean, again, think about, think this is the same woman who refused to sign her work, even though everyone said she should, you know, they were not going to get anything out of her that she didn't, that she didn't want to share. Was it true that she took the pages out of her client book and ate them because on the way to the Gestapo headquarters, because she didn't want them to get these Jewish names? I, again, I've heard it, but I, I, I just hesitate to, to verify because I can't, I can't prove it. But I, you know, we do know, the things I can, we, things we know um, are that after the war, she, uh, she won a Legion of Honor for her, for her help in the resistance. We know that she was chosen in, this is 45, I guess, when they knew that Paris would be liberated and that they symbolically chose General Leclerc's, um, they formed, I guess, a new division, uh, the second armored division, I think, for him to roll back into Paris to have a, a French war veteran to, to liberate Paris rather than one of the allies. They decided that it had to be under a new military insignia, not one that hadn't succeeded in defending the, the nation. And they asked Suzanne to design it. And of course, they would, that would only happen if they, if this was a sort of a verified supporter of, of the resistance. Um, so we still, in fact, I have one of the original ones here, if you'd ever like to see it. And it's this stylized outline of France rep- and with the, with the sea representing the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. But the fact that they asked, you know, as it were, unknown jeweler to design the insignia that would go on the tanks and the armored uh, cars that would roll back in under the arch um, that Hitler had been under only a couple of years before, um, I think is incredibly significant. So I think she was regarded as a as a war hero, even though I don't know all the things she did. Everything she did was incredibly brave. Just to stand out there every day. Isn't it? Outside, you know, where he was locked up and to, to risk it every day, to be going in and all she worried about was him, wasn't it? And to keep the business running. I mean, again, mm. because of these associations, she did, you know, she could have been locked up, but the, the, she apparently she felt it very important to make sure that all the, the craftsmen in the workshop were still able to live during the war and keeping her business going, I think was an act of bravery. Not, it wasn't, certainly wasn't for, for profit. The, the business barely scraped by, but she kept all of them employed. And actually, in, in talking about her career, what's really struck me are the challenges and difficulties and how many times she or Bernard Hertz had to pivot and go in a different direction, rejig the company, think of something different to survive. And now, as we talk about the difficulty people have selling or starting their businesses, and I think, actually, in comparison, it's nothing compared to those war years and what people had to live through and do. Nothing. No, I mean, the fact, you know, look at her career. We've, we've already talked about two world wars and we're, we've only managed to cover half her career so far. So, <laughs> you know, but if, if I may just come back to that, that second chapter, the idea of Jean surviving the, the war. Sorry, Jean was um, Bernard's son. Um, he enlisted as a, as a soldier and was captured. And so he was held as a prisoner of war, but they didn't know he was Jewish. And so he was, he was not killed, barely survived, 
made it back to Paris. Apparently, the family tells the family, the Hertz family are still friends. They told me that Jean somehow managed to make his way into whatever sort of broken down car and was driving into Paris. It actually fell apart on the way into Paris, the last however many miles he walked in and somehow managed to find. He had no, I mean, the family had been, I mean, like so many Jewish families, had been largely, you know, destroyed. And he found Suzanne and she took one look at him and apparently the way the way they told it was that she reached into her bag somehow to find the keys to the gallery, to the shop. And she said, here, I was holding these for your father. But he knew, of course, that that she had bought the, you know, all these, you know, and the, and the, the, the closeness between her and, her and and his father, and they because they were both you know both insisting that they decided to form a fifty fifty partnership, and so for the company changed name uh, for the third time in six years. So in 1946, it became Hertz Belperon. So I think there's a beautiful sort of storyline there. B Hertz, Suzanne Belperon, Hertz Belperon. And, and sadly, of course, the, you know, a partnership with the son instead of the, the father. But, um, you know, it was lifelong devotion to doing the right thing. And I'm just so, I'm, I quite, it's quite moving to think about it. And so she worked happily with Jean for, until they closed the business. Yes, 1974. 1974. And so, she was how old then? She was uh, in her 70s? It's very convenient that she was born in 1900. So it makes her dates <laughs> easy to do. So she was, she was 74 and she lived until she was 80. 80, uh, well, 1983, and she was 82, I think. She just hadn't quite made it to her 83rd birthday. But looking at that timeline, the, you know, the fact that, thir- you know, almost 30 years of her career was was post these wars and that she had lots of opportunity to, to leave, you know, uh, obviously post-war Paris wasn't maybe the place where you'd want to s- start a business, but because she'd already committed to it, all these invitations to go elsewhere or, and follow the follow the almighty American dollar to the West and all that, she was quite happy letting them find her. And they did. And they did. And then she just got new generations of the next celebrities, the next artists like Jean Cocteau or Lauren Bacall or whoever it was would find her. That's right. And, and I think some of the most influential um, ones... Um, worth mentioning Elsa Scaparelli, I think. Um, very interesting to see the work that she did for, for Scap. She made some really beautiful and, and so fitting that they're so avant garde. Um, you know, the, the, um, what we call the, the Scaparelli torque, the black lacquer torque necklace with the pave diamond ball, uh, sort of in the, in the center. It's the simplest design. It's just a toggle clasp on a piece of luggage, but with the finest of materials. Uh, the contrast of the hardest thing on earth, diamond, with the softest thing in jewelry, which is lacquer. I think there's something so beautiful about the simplicity of it. And the fact that it was designed for Scaparelli in 1932, the first year that she was there with, with Hertz, and that Vogue wrote about it in 33 and said something like, let us rejoice, art has returned to jewelry. But again, to say that in 1933, when look at how great the jewelry was of the 20s and early 30s, it, the fact that Vogue in Paris said, Oh, finally, someone doing doing it right. I mean, it's really quite remarkable. And then her own jewellery collection was sold at Sotheby's in 2011? Uh, yes, 10 or 11, yep, yep. Um, and we bought everything we could. There were like 60 lots yep. that went for three times the estimate. Yeah, we bought about a third of them. Um, so Did you? So it was all we could all we could manage, um, and it was a hard thing. We, we My dad and I went to uh, Geneva um, for the sale, and waved the paddle around and got what we could. Uh, but it, yeah, she had a remarkable collection. Why was it so long after her death? She didn't have any children and she left her estate uh, and her apartment um, to her late in life best friend. Um, and it was only when his heir, because he died, he lived quite a long time, it was only when his heir died that it was decided to sell her collection. So basically it, it sat around in a safe for, for decades. I see. And that's the same as her apartment, wasn't it? That was locked up and left, wasn't it? Yes. Like a kind of sleeping... Yes, time capsule. Place. Yeah, sleeping time capsule. And only opened up in, what, 2007? I think that's right. I mean, that is amazing, isn't it? So was her furniture and everything sold at the same time as her jewellery? Um, yes, some of that had already been... Uh, again, I wish that her f- direct family, ha- in a way, had had these things because I think they might have been kept together slightly better because I would have loved to see all of her possessions, um, yes. be, you know, um, just kept kept together just to see how they reflect upon her and on each other. But yes, 
over, over those from 1983 to, nine, to 2010, um, there was a bit of this and that. But luckily, her, her artistic work um, is intact. We have, as I said, these 9,300 9, drawings that she never fastened a stone, as far as I know. She never polished a, a piece of metal. If you, if you, there's a wonderful uh, portrait of her by Horst from 1934, I think, and it's very typical Horstian style with the dramatic diagonal and, and she's posing and she's wearing her, you know, some of her own jewels. Uh, but if you look at her fingernails, um, these are not hands that were sort of working at a, at a, at a bench. These were painter's hands. And you said she had very long fingernails and she used to scoop up the gems with her fingernails, like a little sort of spoon scoop. Yeah, supposedly. Yeah. Actually, my favorite thing about the, the anecdotes of how she interacted with the stones was that when they asked her how she would choose a stone. I mean, of course, she was offered thousands of them uh, probably every month. And how do you pick which one? You know, Suzanne or Madame Ben Perron, of course, she was, uh, there's a formality to her and to the time. And the way she put it is she waited for a stone to wink at her. And I think there's something kind of lovely about that. Back to the idea that she wasn't, wasn't preoccupied with the hierarchy of, of stones. Um, she waited for one just to say, ah, you know, that, that's it. That's the one. That's the shade of blue I'd like, or that's the cut of diamond. You know, people ask sometimes, they they rank jewelers by their minimum standard of diamond. Have you noticed this, Carol? Yes. <laughs> by the minimum standard of diamond that they would use as a house. And they'll say, well, you know, Tiffany does this and, you know, Van Cleef won't sell anything lower than a, you know, than an eye or, or whatever gradation of a diamond, which is nothing wrong with it. But I just think I find it so rigid when it comes to beauty. I mean, we've all seen cape colored um, diamonds that are just beautifully open with an open culet and facet, you know, the faceting done for candlelight rather than these intense lights we have now. And um, she would use it if it was beautiful or a PK stone. Why not? I mean, she set some giant stone. I mean, we, you see the drawings. I mean, there's some 30, 40 carat diamonds in there, you know, but so what if it might have had a certificate? Well, there were no certificates back then. A certificate that, you know, wasn't triple X and D flawless. I, I think it gives her more credibility as an artist. Now, have you read this book that's out by MJ Rose, The Jeweler of Stolen Dreams? I haven't. You've heard about it? Yes, I have. And I, I, I love that, that Suzanne's story is so inspiring even now. I think it's I think it's brilliant. Yes, because it is an extraordinary and 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 she sort of imagines Suzanne outside sending the packages into Bernard and and all of this and it's rather sort of romantic and as you say it's such an extraordinary story and sometimes real stories are stranger than fiction, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And the fact she's taken it and made and fictionalized the story with uh, with another character, a, a modern character running through it, looking back to the war. And it's rather amazing. So you're kind of proud that um, Suzanne's story is taken up like that. Yeah, I am. I, I, I you know, I, I have, I take my job, you know, I, I wear several different hats. But, the, you know, the one that I wear that I take very seriously is, um, let's say, on the, on the, um, on the certification side of verifying old Belperon that's not signed, you really have to be very careful to, to know what you're doing. We only give paperwork um, for the pieces that we can archivally uh, support somehow. I think that's spilled over somewhat into how I think and talk about Suzanne in her in her personal life. In that I just I there are so many. She's such an inspiring character, uh, and there are so many versions sometimes of the same story that I try to to remain a little bit. Um, Only the things you can document. Yeah, just because, you know, I mean, there was there was a woman, I've forgotten her name, Dr. Brown, um, who was inspired by Belperon's story before all of, you know, th this sort of more recent fascination with her work in the, let's say, 1980s and 90s. Um, and my dad met her. and But apparently she was, you know, loved Belperon and her work and her story, but some of it was historical fiction that got inserted in and she would give lectures on Suzanne's uh, life and work, and it's it's a little bit problematic when you get ahead of yourself over what you can actually demonstrate or prove. Oh well, if anyone's listening who could somehow come up with some sort of proof that she ate her Jewish client list, we would love that. <laughs> I know I would love any uh, the, uh, the story. I, I don't think her story is going going away, and and thanks to mm -hmm. thanks to interviews like this, um, I, I I think there's a chance that more information could come out. So good idea. And for you, no one's equaled her inventiveness or virtuosity. And there's no modern jewelers who could challenge her in that way. I mean, I, I don't like to think of, of history as sort of a downhill slope. <laughs> but but I do or, or art for that matter. But I, I really, let's say, yeah, for me, I don't think anyone will ever surpass her. 
that's 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 very personal. But of course, you know, my 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 personal story is so wrapped up in her work. I mean, back as I said, back to when I was eleven, and back to what I do every day. I, I live. I mean, if my arms were just a little longer, I could reach across the room here and 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 touch the um, these leather bound binders we have of her work. I look at them every day. You know, for for one reason or another. And I just think it's, um, it's, it's remarkable what she did and when she did it. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Nico. Thank you so much. It's really fascinating, a fascinating life. Carol, thank you so much for, for the chance to, to talk about something um, that I really care about. I think Suzanne was, was a, a great artist and um, thank you for caring about her. Thank you. Thank you for listening for this and other episodes of If Jewels Could Talk. Please go to our website, carolwalton.com slash podcasts. Do share it any way you can if you've enjoyed it. Share it with friends and we love to have a rating and a comment. For more information about our sponsors, that's foolygemstones.com. Please join me again in two weeks for the next Jeweled Nugget because we will have an extravaganza all about Elizabeth Taylor, her life and her jewels. So join me then. And do put in any questions that you would like answered. The last episode of this season is a free episode and I'm going to answer any of your questions. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. If Jewels Could Talk with Carol Walton is produced by Natasha Cowan, music and editing by Tim Thornton, graphics by Scott Bentley, illustration by Geordie Labanda. You can find our sponsors at foolygemstones.com and me at carolwilton.com. Mm-hmm.